Uh, Jesus, how could I want more? This morning's message is taken from the passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 23, and we're going to get a little insight into uh, our Savior and uh, His willingness to save uh, here this morning as we consider this passage of Scripture. And I'm going to ask you this morning, if you have your Bible, you turn to Luke chapter 23. I'd like to read for us a few verses of Scripture from uh, Luke 23, starting in verse 39. So Luke chapter 23, verse 39. And if you would please stand with me, um, that would be wonderful as I read these several verses. As we consider the thief on the cross this morning, we consider salvation. In verse 39, it says, One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we approach you this morning and in looking into your word we see an amazing, amazing account. We see the account of a sinner who has come and called upon the name of the Lord. And we see the salvation of Jesus Christ in his life. Father, how we thank you that today we come to you and you do not cast us out. Father, you love us with unconditional love. And Father, you have sent Jesus to die for us that we might have the opportunity to place our faith in him and be transformed. We rejoice, Lord, in all that you have accomplished. And Father, we praise your blessed name for the testimony of the thief on the cross. May we exercise faith in our Jesus to the same degree, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Luke alone has the account here of the thief on the cross who is there on the one side of Jesus. And these words are absolutely phenomenal. This interchange is, is filled with all kinds of wonderful truths for us to stop and think about. All the way back in Isaiah chapter 53, there would be a prophecy concerning Jesus, and the reality would be that he would be numbered among the transgressors. What we know is this. At the time that Jesus was crucified, there were two other criminals who were crucified on that same day. One would be on Jesus' left side, and the other would be crucified on his right. And we would understand that they had gone through a horrific time. For Jesus, we know that he has been beaten severely with a cat of nine tails, he is bleeding profusely. His image is so marred that you would not be able to tell by looking at him that he was a human being. The crown of thorns would be pressed down upon his head. The blood is flowing down, and he is in excruciating pain. We know as he is lifted up, the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet are holding him to this this cruel cross. And as he's suffocating there, he's pushing down with his legs, trying to get a breath, and then exhale the words that we're going to hear this morning. It is a very, very sobering time. And it's interesting to note that as Jesus is lifted up, he'll draw all men to himself. There is a thief who responds in a very positive way to Jesus. And I want to show you this morning some of the coolest stuff here in this passage of Scripture because we see right before our eyes how salvation and the power of the gospel is, is a true reality for this one criminal. 
I would say this morning that the first point I want to convey to you is that the thief on the cross is representative. He's a representation of the sinful condition of all mankind. In fact, it's uh, interesting to note that on the one side of Jesus is a criminal who's non-repentant, and then there's one who is indeed repentant. But both of the criminals have something in common, and unfortunately, I must tell you that all of us have something in common with those criminals. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, I'm not a criminal. Well, you might not be a criminal in that sense of the word, and I'm glad that you're not, but even if you are, you need to know this. We all need to be reminded of the fact that there is none righteous, not even one. That Jesus is the only one who lives a sinless life. All of us have sinned, the Bible says. We've fallen short of the glory of God. And we are reminded that the wages of sin is? Exactly. It's death. And as such, the wages of sin is death, but interject, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the criminal on the cross, he is a person who acknowledges his guilt. He acknowledges the fact that he has trespassed. He acknowledges the fact that what he's getting is something he deserves. He's not arguing with the judge. He's not trying to say, listen, judge, I didn't do it. I, I, I didn't do it, I tell you. No, he says, I did do it. And I'm suffering justly because of it. You see, the thief on the cross represents fallen mankind. Every single one of us would get what we deserve. And for us, what we deserve is hell. What we deserve is punishment. What we deserve is, is not eternal life with Christ forever and ever. It's not heaven. It's not paradise. What we deserve is death. And what we deserve, fortunately, we don't have to receive. Because while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we look at this man and we say he is truly a representation of all of fallen humanity. So when Adam and Eve first fell into sin, sin passed unto all men. And so all of us now have a sin nature. All of us are doomed to death and eternal death if it's not for salvation. And so here's this man, and he is representing well fallen mankind. I want you to take your Bibles, and I want to go to the second point here. Take your Bibles, flip over a few pages to Matthew chapter 27. First book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 27 gives us a little bit of an understanding of this man and where his spirituality is, shall I say. And the second point this morning that I want to bring up is the fact that the thief really provides for us a tremendous example of the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. I think you'll understand what I mean as we start to read this. Jesus is mocked, starting there in verse 27, when it says here, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him, they put a scarlet robe on him, after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. Now, why would they put a crown of thorns on Jesus' head? It's because the mockery there is, well, you're saying you're the king of the Jews, so here's your crown. And a reed they put in his right hand, again, mocking him as if that is some type of a ruler's scepter. And then the Bible says that these got together this Roman cohort, and they knelt down before Jesus. They knelt down like he was some type of a king, and then they mocked him. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And if that's not enough, uh, probably the most be just belittling thing that can happen is when someone spits on you. The Bible says they spat on him, and they took the reed, and they began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took a scarlet robe off him, and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. There is so much there uh, that 
tonight we, or this morning we won't go into this. But the reality is it was very painful. As they beat him on his head, he had the thorn of crowns on his head. They put the scarlet robe on him. His whole entire back was laid open right to the very bone. And when they took it off of him, it would have torn itself off like a Band-Aid on a wound. It was all excruciatingly painful. And as they were coming out, we found Cyrene named Simon to, to press him into service because Jesus was in such a, a terrible condition, he could not carry his own cross. When they came to the place of the skull, they gave him wine to drink that was mixed with gall or vinegar, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots, another fulfilled prophecy. And sitting down, they... Uh, began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Verse 38, at that time, two robbers are crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at Jesus, wagging their heads, and they were saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. You're going to do all this great stuff. You're going to, you, you, Jesus said, well, the temple's going to be torn down. In three days, it'll be uh, raised up. And they're mocking him and saying, listen, you need to just save yourself. If you're, the, if you're the son of God, do you see that? Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also among with the scribes and elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others. Remember when Peter was sinking outside the boat? Jesus saved him. Remember when the paralytic was lowered down into the midst? He, he was able to heal him. He saved others, he says, he cannot save himself. He's raised others from the dead. But, but if all this is true, why can't you save yourself? He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Notice 44 says, the robbers, plural, you might want to circle the S, who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. I don't know about you, but that just gets you. Jesus had done nothing wrong. He had never, ever sinned. He had never acted with the wrong emotion. He was perfect all the time. He healed people all over Israel. He did wonderful miracles. He was always teaching. He was always loving. He was always kind. I wonder how much it must have hurt Jesus to hear the mockery that was directed to him while he hung on the cross. I don't know if you and I could even quantify that. And I notice there in verse 44 that there are two robbers, one on the left and one on the right, and both of him, both of them are hurling the exact same comments at Jesus. Oh, why don't you save yourself? And over there in Luke chapter 23, uh, they had to add to the end, you know, save yourself and us. Now, here's where the difference is. Notice with me there on verse 39 of Luke chapter 23. How many of the criminals were hurling abuse? One. Over in Matthew, how many were? Two. What we're going to witness here in this passage of Scripture is really the changing of the heart of an individual. Prior to this, maybe at the beginning when Jesus and the two thieves were going to be crucified, maybe at 9 a.m. when the whole process begins, the insults were fast and furious. I wonder if all of a sudden the thief who, who begins to address Jesus at this point in time, I wonder at noon when it became black as night, I wonder if he started to have a, a change of heart. Maybe he had a change of heart when he realized that there was no way out, that this was the day he's going to die. Maybe the lack of peace in his heart began to eat at his soul. 
But he comes to the point, and we see six things that happen here in this passage. Six things I just want to point out. Starting there, he begins to say, as the non-repentant thief would say, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, and he rebukes his co-criminal. I always wondered if those two weren't in cahoots, maybe robbing banks. You know what I mean? I don't know what they were doing, but maybe they knew each other, and they were caught doing the same thing. But he says, listen, he says, do you not even fear God? When life is on the line, things change in our hearts. When we realize that the finality of life could really be coming quickly, it changes how we think. So many people go through life and they're very cavalier about death and dying. They're not fearful. You know, they're kind of the John Wayne type and, you know, yeah, it's not scaring me. Uh, I've got all it figured out, you know, and I die. How many times I've heard, when I die, I'm going to get down there to hell and we're going to put together the whale of a bowling league with my friends. I'm not really sure that's going to be the case. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Uh, but everybody can talk big, can't they? They can talk big. You can really talk big. And it can seem like you have no fear. This past week, we were vacationing with our family, and our two grandsons were there. And the one isn't two years old yet. He's about 22 months and he's got one of those little things that they make now that you can actually float and kick your legs and swim around the pool. They're pretty cool things. But he would walk over to the edge of the pool and he'd just jump right in the water. I mean, like, launch. And down he'd go, under the water. And he never came up one time sputtering. He came up smiling. He had absolutely no fear of that. We went over to a higher place where it was a little over a foot, and I thought, I don't think he's going to jump now. And he did. And he smiled when he came up. And he would go way down her dirt, and he'd pop back up, you know. And he was just happy. As, and I'm like, oh. he had no fear. Now, some people act like they have no fear. But here is the thief on the cross. And I want you to understand, both of these men know it's over real soon. And I wonder at that point if he didn't show his belief in the future afterlife where there is retribution and judgment. Because now he's starting to think about, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen in the future. One thing that's interesting about him is that you notice in this passage when he asks the other thief, don't you even fear God? He says, you're under the same sentence of condemnation. In other words, the three of us are in a bad way and we're all three of us going to die. But he says, and we indeed are suffering justly for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, he says, has done nothing wrong. We indeed are suffering justly. This man had an understanding of his sinfulness. Uh, at some point, he came to understand that he was wicked. Isn't that amazing? There he is, he's hanging on the cross, and all of a sudden, he's not hurling insults anymore, but he's looking at his own heart, and he's saying, hmm, I'm up here on this cross, and I'm suffering for a reason. There's a reason I'm here. And he looked at his life and he realizes that he is indeed sinful. The third thing that he realizes, and he acknowledges this in verse 41, when he looks at Jesus and he compares himself to Jesus, he says, but this man has done nothing wrong. You see, Jesus can be our savior because he has never sinned. You and I are full of sin. You and I are wicked. You and I know what it means to, to feel guilt and remorse over sinful behavior. But there is Jesus, and he has done nothing wrong. Now, it is revolutionary for this man to be able to look at Jesus at this point and say, here is a person who has done absolutely nothing wrong. Jesus didn't look like much hanging on that cross. His body was broken, his Blood is flowing down. But the fourth point is he believed Jesus was the true Savior of mankind. And he would say to him, and you see it there in our passage, verse 42, he says, Jesus, remember me. Jesus, remember me. Regardless of Jesus' current state of humiliation, he looks to Jesus 
as his Savior. Isn't that amazing? You and I have images in our mind of, of what Jesus looks like, probably. And it might be associated to some artist's rendition, right? I mean, that's kind of unfortunate, but that's a lot of times the way we think. And maybe you have, at different points in Jesus' ministry, you have images in your mind of what Jesus looks like. Maybe you think John 17, and you think, oh, there's Jesus in all his glory, and that's your image of Jesus. Uh, maybe you're like me, and I see him on the white horse coming back at the second coming. Uh, maybe you look at him, and he's, he's ministering to the little children. Maybe he's walking on the water. Maybe he's feeding the, the, the thousands that are hungry. I don't know what it may be. Maybe you have this image, but I don't think any one of us has the image in our mind when we think of Jesus as an unrecognizable human being hanging on the cross covered with blood. The Passion of the Christ couldn't capture it, that movie. This man calls on Jesus in Jesus' horrendous condition. There is a great deal of faith in doing that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's exactly what this man does. Jesus, remember me. He's calling on Jesus' name. And you see how, how it's transformed from being one who is mocking and hurling insults at Jesus to all of a sudden, hmm, I think I'm here for a reason, and it's not a good reason. I, I don't see anything in Jesus that would cause me to believe that he's wicked at all. In fact, he must have heard Jesus maybe saying things that were very compassionate, very kind. And he is moved then to realize, Jesus, it's been true what they've said about you. And he personally now is placing his faith in the one true Savior. Now, it's pretty amazing, but he's also looking ahead Remember me, he says, when you come into your kingdom. That's pretty neat. Because there is Jesus hanging on the cross. He doesn't look like he's coming into his kingdom anytime soon, does he? I mean, that, that's kind of like, oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this has really worked out. Isn't it true in the disciples' mind? I mean, talking about the, the, the 11 that are now here and living. The 11 disciples are looking at it and going, uh, I don't know if this is turning out like we planned. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure this is, this is the route we all intended to go. And yet this man is able to place his faith in Jesus, even in Jesus' condition. And I submit to you that there is a tremendous amount of faith involved in that. Now the third point is the thief's conversion really does demonstrate Christ's desire to save the lost. And I think it just demonstrates it in a tremendous, tremendous way. I don't know about you, but how many of you here Hold a grudge. Oh, don't raise your hand. <laughs> we all tend to hold grudges, don't we? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, some to greater extents, I understand that. But we all tend to, to hold a grudge. Now, if someone was hurling insults at you at 9 a.m. in the morning from 9 until, let's say, 9 until noon, being saying horrible things about you as you're suffering there, taking every breath that you, you can possibly get to, to keep from suffocating, and while that's all going on, this person then comes and says, oh, would you forgive me? What would your response be? You, you see, here you have the demonstration of a response that is, is truly God. When it says God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, the purpose for God's demonstration of love was to seek and to save that which is lost, is it not? And it is not diminished because Jesus is hanging on the cross in excruciating pain. Jesus is looking at all of the people in the world, and he's looking at them with the idea that he wants to, to save every single one of them from the consequences of their sin. And so what is Jesus' response? You'll notice it there as we read here. When he said this to him, he said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, Jesus has a desire to save. And I know that God's desire to save souls today is not, any, is not diminished at all. Uh, Jesus just as much wants people today to come and place their faith in him and be truly transformed as the thief on the cross is being transformed. 
This is a wonderful Savior that we have, amen? We, we, we can't even really wrap our heads around the love of Christ how much he has done for us and how much he continues to want to do. I don't know about you, but if I get a little thing wrong with me, I'm not that nice to be around. If I've got a toothache, I'm thinking about the tooth. I'm sorry. You see, we tend to be that way. But here is Jesus, and he's outwardly focused. Isn't it amazing, our Savior? There is no one like him. Fourth point here is a point for us to consider The thief's faith leads us to understand the reality of eternal life in paradise. I want you to see with me here uh, what verse 43 says. Uh, Once again, as you look closely at this, you see the words that Jesus spoke. Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. When Jesus says this, there is a particular word order in the original language. And by looking at the original, you can actually get um, an understanding of what the word there is that's being emphasized. And there is a word here that is being emphasized more than the other words. And the word that really you want to underline in your Bible is the word today. It's the word today. When Jesus looks at him, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, here you see the grace of God really going beyond man's expectations. Because what was the thief asking for? He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, that future down the road. You know, I I hope someday when it all happens that you'll somehow remember me wherever I am. But that's not what Jesus answers. Jesus looks at him and says, underscore it there, today you will be with me in paradise. It's not going to happen down the road. It's going to happen today. Now, can you imagine how exciting it must have been for that robber when he realized that he'd come to Jesus and placed his faith in Jesus? And Jesus said to him, listen, today. Now, what was going to happen today? They were going to die. They were both going to die. And yet Jesus says today, there's going to be something happening that is mind-boggling. You are going to be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 16 gives us a story of the rich man and Lazarus. And we would understand that when a person died back in the Old Testament and before the resurrection... That there was a place of the dead. The realm of the dead is known Sheol, Hades. And we understand that with the rich man and Lazarus, there was a distinction between where they ended up. Let me just give you a couple things. Here's an artist's rendition. There's, you can figure out which is which, can't you? The rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was poor. He had the, uh, the scraps from off of the rich man's table to eat. And yet, when they both died in Jesus' teaching, when they both died, they didn't go to the places you'd expect. For you would have expected that the rich man would end up in, in heaven or in paradise, and you would probably think that the poor man would end up in Hades. But they both go to the realm of the dead, the scriptures describe it, and it is the rich man who's in the place of torment. It is not Lazarus. Now, understanding what is paradise, what does he mean by you'll be with me in paradise? When Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead, I don't want to get too too theological on you this morning, but when he resurrected from the dead, uh, those who were in that place or that realm of the dead uh, went to heaven. And so instead of having a place where there's two compartments, there's now a realm of the dead, and then there's paradise, there's heaven, and they're the same. I don't know what you have in mind when you think of uh, paradise. Uh, Maybe it's something like that. (laughs) Hopefully not. Uh, Maybe when you think of paradise, you think of, oh, that would just be paradise. I'm not even going to try to put a picture up that's really paradise. Because you and I can't even wrap our heads around what heaven is truly like. For the Bible gives us very little information. We can try to conjecture, we can try to draw up a plan, but the truth of the matter is, it's done for a reason. It's it's left out because you and I couldn't comprehend it. 
The important thing that we need to understand, the important thing we have to remember is that the reality is that what Jesus wants to do is to keep us from hell, and he wants, most importantly, uh, to fellowship with us. And this is the amazing reality. When Jesus looks at this robber, he does not see this robber in his sin, dead in his trespasses and sin. He sees this robber, this thief, as one who has been spiritually made alive because of his faith in Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, that's wonderful. Now, it's not enough for God to save us from the consequences of our sin. This is where the lid gets blown off. God has a desire to fellowship with us. And this is so applied here in Jesus' teachings. Truly I say to you today, you shall be, what's the next two words? With me. Isn't it amazing that Jesus wants this former condemned criminal, mocker, rebellious, fill in the blanks, converted, transformed, regenerated, born again, individual. He wants him with him in paradise. Isn't that phenomenal? You see, God just didn't create us to redeem us. God created us to have fellowship with us. And going all the way back to the Garden of Eden where the fellowship was broken, this has been the plan to restore the fellowship of broken human beings sinful human beings with a God who is holy and just and perfect. This is the culmination of God's plan. God is looking forward to the time when the church will be with him in glory. And the church will be praising his name. The bride of Christ will be celebrating with God the Father and we will enjoy fellowship with God. This is God's desire. This is God's plan. And as sinful as we might have been, it has no bearing on our future fellowship with Christ if we have been saved by grace. You see how wonderful this is? Here is this man whose life has been transformed, and he has gone from having absolutely no chance to all of a sudden a brilliant hope and a faith that was real, which brings him to a point of having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and now he's looking forward to the greatest time in his life that lays ahead of him. You see, there's tremendous hope while there's still time. And I trust this morning that you know that type of joy. As we live out this life, we need to remember that this is not all there is. That there is a fellowship that waits ahead. And there is going to be nothing in your life or in my life that will ever compare to the fellowship that we have with God. We can't even quantify what that fellowship actually looks like. I don't know how many times I've thought about what it must have been like for Adam and Eve to, to fellowship with God in the garden before the fall. I don't know. I can just imagine. But the same thing is going to be true without the, the possibility of sin when we get to heaven. And we'll enjoy the fellowship with Christ throughout all of eternity. Isn't that amazing? You see, we need to stop and we need to consider that God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Someone said that the pinnacle of Christian privilege is fellowship with God. There's nothing higher than fellowship with God. Now, I want to remind you, there were two criminals that were crucified the day Jesus was crucified. The one comes to understand, repent, believe, and his life is transformed, and he has a tremendous future. The other continued to hurl insults, as far as we know, at Jesus. He had no fear of God. He had no realization of his own sin, perhaps. And at no point do we have any written record of him coming to faith in Jesus. The world is filled with people that are either of one sort or the other. Either people who have placed their faith in Jesus, who are looking forward to the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ, and those who have no hope. If you're here this morning, 
and you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, I want to give you hope. Because if you will place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be transformed as the thief on the cross was transformed. You can know the joy of the Lord. You, there's no reason for you to leave here today without your expectation of looking towards the future in a time of blessing and fellowship with Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? But you have to exercise that faith in Christ Jesus. Will you take that step of faith today and have that bright future for tomorrow? Let's bow our heads this, together this morning. You may be here this morning and it may be that God is speaking to your heart. You, maybe you don't have that peace. Maybe you're in a condition that you would say is very similar to, to many who don't know where they're going to spend their eternity. But maybe you're here this morning and say, I'm really not satisfied with that. I really want to know where my eternity lies. My friends, maybe you would acknowledge as the thief on the cross acknowledged that there is only one Savior. Jesus would say, I am the truth and the life. No man can come to the Father except it be through me. Maybe you're here this morning and God's tugging at your heart. Maybe you're here this morning and you know Christ as your Savior. I wonder while our heads are bowed, if you would just take a moment, as I have prayed, and just thank him for being that loving Savior and working in your heart to save you from your sin. I'd like to have a word of prayer. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. Pray for me today. I know I need to place my faith in Christ. Maybe you'd say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I'm just not at peace. Maybe you'd say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I, I, I know God's at work in my life. Whatever it may be, I'd love to pray for you this morning. I'm going to close in prayer right now. If you just slip up your hand, I'd love to pray for you today. If you'd say God's working in your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father in heaven, we do indeed praise your name for what you have done for us. Thank you for working in our hearts today, Lord. Be with these who've asked for prayer, Lord. And Lord, we pray that we would all grow to appreciate you in a greater way, love you more deeply. And truly be thankful to a greater extent for the salvation that you've brought to us. And Lord, I pray for those that may be here today who are not certain of where their eternal destination lies. Maybe they're not sure if they've truly placed their faith in Jesus. But Father, if you're working in their heart, I pray that they would yield themselves to the Holy Spirit of God's working. And that they would bow the knee to you, Lord, and place their faith in Jesus knowing that truly there is only one Savior. Father, we thank you for the work you're doing in our hearts and lives. May you be glorified, I pray, in all these things. For it's in Christ's name we pray it together. Amen. This morning before you...